Hello, and welcome to our next week of the story of Christianity. The past two weeks, we've looked at the First Great Awakening and American colonial religion, as well as the Enlightenment. Today, we'll be bringing some of these themes together in a period known as the Second Great Awakening in America. We'll be tracing the religious developments in the, uh, the newly founded United States from roughly the time of the Revolution up to the Civil War. We'll be leaving some of the specifics around the causes of the Civil War and its effects on religion for the next lecture. This is a very significant time in American church history, and because it's important in American church history, it becomes significant in the global spread of Christianity as well, as during this period many missionary movements are developed, which we'll talk about in subsequent lectures. But I want to begin with a question. How is it that Christianity came to look the way it does today? With multiple denominations, parachurch organizations, Christian colleges, par um, small groups, um, altar calls, all these things, which in 1750 would have seemed completely um, out of left field. If we recall, in the colonial period, there were only three or four Christian traditions in America. The Reformed, the Lutheran, the Catholic, and the Anglican. And these were all stemming from the religious changes brought on in the Reformation period in England. These ideas were brought over and planted in American soil at various points determined by the settling patterns of the various um, immigrants to the New World. However, by the time we get to the end of the 19th century, we will see hundreds of denominations um, in a society that looks very different from anything like the colonial period. So how did this occur, and how has this shaped the ways that we understand Christianity in the modern world? So we're going to cover several things. We're going to look at the landscape of American religion after independence. We'll look at the period known as the Second Great Awakening and the various religious changes that this brought about in unifying the new nation and the different... Um, emphases that this brought to Christianity. We'll then look at something called the Benevolent Empire and how the awakenings issued into social reform in a large variety of settings. And then we'll look at how at the same time that the Second Great Awakening is in somehow bringing the nation together religiously, there is also an increasing fractionalization of American religious landscape uh, with various new groups coming about that in some ways are unique in the history of the Western world. Let's begin by remembering some of the background from the Enlightenment period. The Enlightenment, largely born out of thought in both England and Germany in the 17th and 18th century, led to a challenge to all traditional authority, especially church authority. Many of these ideas of the challenges of church and ecclesial authority would be bore out in the American experience. We also have the challenge to traditional political authority, which we see coming to fruition in the American Revolution. There's also the emphasis on the individual. As opposed to the corporate nature of religion and society, the individual becomes the focus of most attention. We also see this new emphasis on the view of history, that history will inevitably progress, that human beings are innately perfectible, that they are not limited by their environment, but through the exercise of reason and empirical study can change the world for the better. The idea of changing the world that is often set forward uh, today is not something that was prevalent throughout most of human history. The world was there, and it was something that had to be dealt with. With the Enlightenment comes the concept that human beings, through their effort and will, can fundamentally change the nature of society, reality, and the church. And these ideas will be perpetuated, especially in the American experiment. And also recall the different concepts of the human person, focusing far less on the traditional doctrines of original sin and dependence on God, but rather much more on an expression of the individual. Think back to Rousseau and this idea that humanity is innately good and just needs the structures of society to be removed or changed so that the innate human goodness can come about. All of these ideas will feed into the both political and ecclesial ideology of the early American Republic. We also must understand the monumental change that was the American Revolution. So the American colonies that we discuss openly revolted from English rule in 1776. We won't go into the history of the Revolutionary War. Um, I would recommend you read that on your own time if you're interested. The most, um, most American churches were supportive of independence. In fact, King George III, who was the King of England at the time, called it the Presbyterian War, because of the support by many Scotch-Irish Presbyterians. 
Um, however, certain uh, groups stayed loyal to the crown, especially Anglicanism in the South, and some Methodists, which caused a break in some ways between uh, John Wesley and the American Methodist Church, which found this um, a rather difficult uh, idea to swallow. The most important thing for the story of Christianity about the founding of the American Republic is that it ushered in a new era of church history, and this is done with the idea of the separation of church and state. Throughout um, the period we've been looking at since the fourth century, church and state have in some ways been allied or united. This begins with Constantine, in which he ushers in this period where the empire supports the ecclesia. This is perpetuated throughout the Middle Ages in various ways. We looked at this throughout that time. And even after the Reformation, although Christendom is in some ways cracked by the splitting of the western half of the church into Protestant and Catholic, they still perpetuate the unity of church and state. We now have a Reformed Christendom, a Lutheran Christendom, an Anglican Christendom, and a Roman Catholic Christendom. And yet they still have this unified idea that the society and the church are to work together um, for the perpetuation of true religion and the pursuit of political order. With the American Revolution, this is fundamentally changed. We can see it putting forth in some of the original documents of the founding of America. First set forth the principle of religious toleration, which is enshrined in the American Constitution. Uh, this is done in Act 6, which is called uh, the Test article. So it says there are no religious tests shall ever be required as qualifications to any office or public trust under the United States. This provision is intentionally directed at laws in England in which there was a religious test for applications to university. For instance, um, non-Anglicans were not allowed to attend Oxford or Cambridge into the 19th century, and one was only able to participate in Parliament as one who professed at least Protestantism later on um, and generally Anglicanism in the earlier period. So right there there's a separation between the qualities that one would want in leadership and the nature of religion. This was put in place so that the various competing religious traditions of the Republic could coexist. However, the most significant feature of the American experiment is found in the First Amendment and its statements regarding religion. The First Amendment that's in the Bill of Rights, ratified in 1791, says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the rights of the people, peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The First Amendment to the Constitution establishes that the state shall not interfere or take sides in religious disputes, and that the church will receive no special um, allowances from the state. Now, this is against what was going on in Europe at the time, in which each nation still had an established religion that had certain privileges before the state, uh, specifically receiving tithes, uh, receiving social prestige, and in some ways having um, the ability to dictate the policies of society. Okay? With this change, in the First Amendment, we do see the end of Christendom officially. This is the first large-scale toleration anywhere in the world, and it will have in some ways unintended consequences and lead to an unprecedented situation in the history of the church, in which uh, there is no longer the power of the state either to incorporate good ideas back into the church or guard the church from outside or heretical views. And so these things combine to fundamentally change the shape and nature of uh, Christianity in America, but also from there throughout the rest of the world. And as I said, this is an unprecedented idea stretching back to the fourth century. And so this is very important for us to pay attention to because we're used to this being normal. But in fact, this this changed the experience of the church. The church turned into something else. It was separable from society and could now be seen as merely one kind of bucket within a much broader idea. And we can express this as the church as a voluntary society. In much of Europe and throughout the world, to be born into a nation was to be born into the church. If one was born in Spain, for instance, one was a Roman Catholic. If one was born into England, one was by default generally an Anglican unless one's parents took a, um, a dissenting position, which puts you at more the fringe of society. 
because the United States became the first nation with full religious toleration, the church had to change its conceptions of how to relate to society itself. Okay? This compounds with ideas from the colonial period, especially in the First Great Awakening, um, that society and nation could be separated. Okay? This means that the church is now something one voluntarily enters and can voluntarily exit. It is no longer a part of one's um, innate identity, and that's going to make churches have to, in some ways, compete in an open marketplace of religious ideas to gain adherence, and that's going to have various effects on the church. In the early stages of the American Republic, we see an erosion of the uniformity of religion that existed in the colonial period. Much of the older traditions we've talked about, such as the Anglicans, the Congregationalists, the Presbyterians, persisted in the colonies and continued to grow as, in some ways, the de facto culturally established religions. However, after independence, many new and dissenting groups flourished. Specific amongst those are Methodists, who began to grow quite rapidly under the guidance of Asbury, the Baptists, who took off in this period, and an increase in Lutheran populations through immigration from Germany as well as Quaker and Mennonite communities in western Pennsylvania um, developing very well. In this period, we see the continued emphasis of the shift on the more experiential Christianity, which had become popular in the first grade and awakening. What this had done over time is it um, acted to relativize the theological distinctives of these various groups. So it didn't matter as much anymore to the people of the colony of the distinctive theological ideas of Congregationalism or Anglicanism or Presbyterianism. And this is going to have the effect of weakening the ties with the old denominations and creating more opportunities within these newer and dissenting groups. It's this idea, this emphasis on experiential religion, having a personal relationship and conversion experience that will in some way shake up the religious scene in America and will create many more new uh, denominations and groups throughout the 19th century. In addition to the changes happening in, uh, on the religious scene is also the coming of the Enlightenment very heavily into the American context. And we can see this primarily in the rise of deism and Unitarianism. We've already talked about deism as it rose in England, but it does come across the pond and is a pretty large force throughout um, the founding of the Republic. Many of the founding fathers, such as uh, Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, um, George Washington as well, were in fact deists, although they held membership in the Anglican Church in Virginia. We can see some of this coming about and the differences it will have for American religion in the work of a man named Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine was one of the early patriots of the Revolutionary War, writing a book called Common Sense, calling for the independence of the American colonies from Great Britain. But after the Revolution, he wrote a book called The Age of Reason, which sought to perpetuate Enlightenment ideas primarily from the French Revolution in the American context. And this is what he says about his own faith. I do not believe in the creed professed by the Jewish church, by the Roman church, by the Greek church, by the Turkish church, by the Protestant church, nor any church that I know of. My own mind is my own church. So this is very much the idea of Deus, this complete rejection of religious authority and this unique idea of the individual as the one who can discern all truth. Paine will go on to express an idea in an ultimate creator and the needs of a moral life, but sure religion of all elements of the supernatural, or of grace, or of the need of the cross and resurrection. There is, in some ways, a, another place that's not quite as far as the deist, which is the Unitarians. The Unitarians reject the doctrine of the Trinity and the divinity of Christ, trying to incorporate the rationalist philosophy of the Enlightenment with Christianity. This first appears in Boston in 1782, with the first Unitarian Church there, and it will spread quite rapidly through New England. In fact, in 1805, the first U.S. college, Harvard University, actually takes on a Unitarian theology in 1805, beginning a perpetuation of these ideas throughout the colonial world. So we see in the period after the the American Revolution, an erosion of the religious uniformity. This is also matched with a decrease of religious participation, much as we saw after the First Great Awakening. It is often estimated that at, immediately after the Revolution, only roughly 
of the American population would attend or be active in the church. Let's think a little bit more about the effects that religious toleration would have on the churches. So this is a completely unprecedented idea, as I've said, such that the church could no longer rely on its unique place within the society and in some ways had to make it. Because of this, denominational allegiance could no longer be taken for granted. One could not rely on the fact that um, one would accept the teachings of, say, Anglicanism or Presbyterianism as kind of what we all do. There are now a broad range of religious options that one could choose from. Therefore, the churches had to switch to a mode of active persuasion within what we might call a religious marketplace. And that one, if one could actively choose in town to go to the Presbyterian, Congregationalist, or Anglican Church, and there's an emphasis much more on experience than doctrine, the, the churches are going to have to seek to persuade members not only to enter their denominations, but to stay. And this will fundamentally shift, in some ways, the nature of preaching. It will be much, much less about doctrinal precision and much more on the um, focusing on the individual and their uh, felt needs, trying to induce their experience of God. This will also have um, effects in how worship is done with the perpetuation of popular hymns coming about this day. Another issue that they had to dealt, deal with was that there was no longer state funding for the churches via the tithe, and therefore all the churches relied on was voluntary giving. Um, this might seem fairly standard to you. Most churches that you would go to function in this way. However, this was a fundamental shift from the previous period in which many state churches were funded by taxpayer money. And this is a good thing in some ways because you are no longer beholden to the state um, who can dictate the theology of the church. However, if one is being um, forced to continually convince the people that your particular branch of the church is um, the most viable, your Reliance on the money is no longer the reliance on the state, but now the reliance on the individual. And this will increase a temptation that has been felt ever since this point in churches to preach in such a way to please the hearer so that they will give, so that they will attend, and leads to a potential compromise of the word of God to please the hearer. Now, these effects of religious toleration did not have an immediate effect everywhere in uh, the United States, uh, because the Constitution, as it was originally written, only applied on the federal level. Many states still had established churches in the early 19th century. However, beginning in the 1790s, many of the churches were disestablished, separated from the control of the government and the support of the government, with the final disestablishment taking place in Massachusetts in 1833. But these ideas, the ability to choose between denominations, the lessening of the significance of theological distinctions, and the increased emphasis on the hearer as opposed to the word, could cause problems and would fundamentally shift the shape of American Christianity from there on out. There's another question that we should engage with on an understanding of American religion, and that is, are these divisions within the church merely the result of class divides? H. Richard Niebuhr, a 20th century American theologian, originally proposed that the spread of various denominations was more the product of socioeconomic divisions than theological issues. Okay. This, this is a very interesting thesis, because we'll see as we go through an, a couple slides that there do, do seem to be fairly clear socioeconomic divisions between certain denominations and others, with the poor gravitating towards a certain field of denomination and the wealthy and middle class to another. However, the original thesis, as it's presented by Niebuhr, is a little simplistic. It is not as if, um, although theological distinctives were lessened in this period, it's not as if they went away entirely, nor is it the fact that these denominations would be purely from one class or another. However, there did and does seem to exist in the American church a divide amongst religious traditions due not only to economics but also to cultural divides between classes. Um, and I think this is an interesting idea and it helps us to understand in some ways why the church in America looks like it does even today and how churches in various parts of the world have um, played out along different class lines. 
Mark Knoll um, has made a much clearer different, uh, distinction here that lays out the combined issues of both class and culture. And he divides the American churches into two camps, the formalist and the anti-formalist. This is primarily uh, trying to assess the different types of religion and where they flourished in the 19th century. So let's begin by looking at the formalist religions according to Knoll's typology. So in the formalist, we could include such traditions as the Episcopalian Church, the Lutheran Church, Dutch Reformed, Congregationalist, and Presbyterian. If you note, these are the traditions that have been in America since the colonial founding. Okay, they have the longest history in some ways in the, uh, in the New World. These churches tend to um, have tended to um, attract both middle and upper class participants, mostly in the north uh, and somewhat in the upper Midwest. They trace all of their identities back to the magisterial reformers, that is Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, etc. Um, they have a formal, formal liturgy and a formal church structure based upon the previous ideas of church leadership presented in the Reformation. And they require an educated clergy, and therefore they must create educational systems of colleges and seminaries in order to provide their own clergy. And something that Noel points out that I think is accurate is these formalist churches have what he calls a propri proprietary attitude towards the social order, seeming as this is our society and we need to protect it. We need to preserve order and keep it. The formalist churches will largely be attractive to those of the upper middle class and the upper class because of this kind of active participation and long-term standing within the colonial society. And we can see many of this today. Many of these traditions will um, move into what we know as the mainline churches in the mid 20th century, although conservative branches will branch off of that. In distinction from the formalists are what Noel calls the anti-formalist churches. He numbers amongst these the Methodists, the Baptists, and I would add in here the Restorationist churches, that is the Disciples of Christ and the Churches of Christ, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. These anti-formalist churches seem to resonate much more with the cultural preferences of the lower middle class and the lower class. And this is partially due to their engagement on the American frontier in the early years of um, the United States. Mostly found, therefore, in the West and the South, this is, um, these anti-formalist movements did much better in frontier and uh, less urbanized societies, so it's a very rural movement. This is partially because they trace their identity to groups formed and movements that were done after the Reformation, most of them coming from um, uniquely homegrown American roots or through the Methodists who engaged very much after the First Great Awakening. They're marked much more with an informal worship and church structure that's generally on a more congregationalist and loose um, order. They also have generally a looser doctrinal standard than the older churches. Their clergy is much more itinerant, meaning they move from place to place. This was a marked feature of both Methodist and Baptist preachers and many of the early Restorationists as well, that their clergy would move from place to place preaching revivals, preaching at new churches, and seeking to evangelize. And in these new churches, we have a much heavier leaning on an Arminian theology. That is a theology that focuses on the freedom of the human will to choose God. This isn't the case for all, but especially in the Methodist and half of the Baptist traditions and the Restorationist tradition, this is the case. So while the formalist churches harken back to the age of the Reformation in a more um, immediate fashion, holding to Reformation era theology and focusing on both theology and practice, the anti-formalists will be much more pragmatic. They will uh, seek to adjust to the situation in America much more quickly. And in this situation that we've discussed in which churches and denominations are competing for persuasion and for tithes within a competitive religious marketplace, we'll see a stronger differentiation of these two trends, with the formalists trying to adapt to reach and um, accommodate those of middle and upper class persuasions, while the anti-formalists trying to seek and to persuade those of primarily lower class and rural persuasions. And these ideas will uh, cause these denominations to often become a conflict uh, throughout this period. 
In the early republic, we also see the idea of the formation of denominational infrastructure, uh, which is an important feature for the rest of American church history. So religious liberty created the denomination as an organizational body of the church. You might think, well, denominations have always existed. Well, that's not exactly the case. There's a difference between a tradition and a denomination. A tradition is a set of doctrinal beliefs and practices that are handed down. These traditions, whether they be Lutheran, Reformed, or Catholic, are then instantiated generally before the time of religious toleration in a state church. And therefore, they are established and their church structure has developed organically over hundreds of years. And so it's not quite the same thing. A denomination is something within a broader sweep of tradition, a set of structures, a set of ordinances, a set of ties of how to structure the church. So with the rise of denominations in America, we see partially this is due towards religious toleration, and there's the ability to create and even split denominations, which would have been much more difficult in previous times. And because of the rapid expansion of America to the West, a need to create flexible structures in which church governance can be achieved. Many of these things had not needed to be done in the middle in Europe since roughly 1000 AD. So therefore, after the break with uh, Great Britain, the American churches had to figure out how to live after they've severed ties with their old world counterparts. For instance, uh, the American Anglican Church breaks ties with the Church of England, forming the Episcopalian Church. They have to establish new uh, regulations for the education of clergy, for the ordination of bishops, etc. We also see similar moves come with the Methodists, who break away from the Methodist movement in Great Britain and uh, uh, call their own conference in, in the 1780s and appoint their own bishops. We see similar things happening in the Presbyterian Church with the calling of the First General Assembly in 1789. One of the things that we need to talk about with the spread of denominations is the foundation of the African American churches. So, as we talked about in the early period of America, many slaveholders were reluctant and even prohibited the preaching of the gospel to the enslaved African population, fearing that uh, if they became baptized, they would have to be treated as equal, on equal footing. As we move past that into the First Great Awakening, there is an active attempt to evangelize um, these peoples. But they still experienced segregation and second-class citizenship in the church in both the North and the South. Therefore, as a protest against this unchristian practice that undermined the God-given dignity, many black pastors divided from the white church to form their own denominations. The first breakaway from official um, white denominations to form black denominations came by the work of Richard Allen and uh, um, Absalom Jones, who left St. George's Methodist Church in Philadelphia in 1787. Basically, these two men had been fed up. They were both lay preachers in the Methodist Church, um, and they were drawing congregants who uh, generally freed black population who would come to early services. However, they were told to segregate their congregation from the rest um, by the local white Methodist preachers. This eventually caused them to be quite angry and annoyed, and they moved and created their own Methodist church in the town, with uh, Richard Allen taking on second, secondary work in order to serve this congregation. Over the years, there was continued struggles with the heads of the Methodist organization, and in, 1860, in 1816, uh, Allen would be elected the first bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, or AME, which will be the first um, completely self-governed by African-Americans church in the United States. Absalom Jones himself would go on to found an all-black Episcopalian church and would be the first ordained black priest in the American Episcopalian church. So after this kind of wave of <clears throat> setting up new churches, and there are several others we could talk about, mostly Methodists and Baptists, we see many African-Americans converted during the Second Great Awakening, especially by those who are going on circuit riding. So this is why to this day uh, the, prim the primary um, doctrinal affiliation of most African Americans is either Methodist or Baptist or traditions that flow out of that, such as the holiness movement, which we'll talk about later. The black church would become increasingly significant for the black community throughout both the age of slavery, the Civil War, and the Jim Crow era. And this preaching focused very much on 
uh, themes of racial equality, justice, education, and freedom. One of the main themes within uh, that many of these early African American preachers took to was the theme of the Exodus, seeing themselves and their own enslaved conditions in the enslaved um, Hebrews, and seeing God's call of the Israelite people out of Egypt as the same call for them in their current bondage in the American South and beyond. So we'll revisit some of these issues as we look at the American Civil War next time. Okay, so we've seen how the church developed after the revolution. We see an increase in religious diversity with these new traditions to being, being developed. We see distinctions in the class of various denominations. But at this time after the revolution, there was a low ebb of religion once again. Because partially of the move to the West and the influence of Enlightenment thinking, uh, there were few churches and fewer pastors, and um, there was just not much interest in religion. It had been much more focused on the ideas of liberation from Great Britain, and church attendance was at perhaps an all-time low. Into this comes the Second Great Awakening. While the First Great Awakening can be seen as much more of an event occurring over a few years with very discreet persons involved, the Second Great Awakening is more of an era stretching from, the 18, from 1800 to the 1840s, with a main phase taking place from 1820s to 30s. In this era, uh, revivals cropped up throughout the country, um, perpetuated by countless uh, missionary preachers and throughout each denomination. This would be a definitive event for shaping the nature of the American religious landscape. So we're going to look at some of the events that took place to forward this and the consequences of it for American society. The beginning of the awakening is generally connected to revivals in Eastern colleges, in which many students converted and entered into the ministry. These young pastors would then go to the frontier and conduct um, evangelism there, leading to more revivals. It's generally connected to some work by a man named Timothy Dwight, who was in fact the grandson of Jonathan Edwards, after he became president of Yale University in 1785. So sorry, 1795. Over his years there, over a third of the, a third of the students would profess faith in Christ, and this would give a religious fervor to the student body and lead them out to be leaders of the church and to give to support revival activities throughout the, the United States. Other awakenings would follow this at Yale, uh, at both Dartmouth, Williams College, and Amherst. From there, the awakening would also take root in western New York. You can see on the map marked in orange, in what was known as the Burnt Over District. Now, this is not because this district was poor or to experience fires, but it had been burnt over by the Holy Spirit, such that the main evangelist there, Charles Finney, said there was no more tinder for the Holy Spirit to burn, for all had been converted. It'd be out of this region of New York that we would see many uh, pushes for revival throughout the country and many pushes for social reform. In this, we'll look at Charles Finney again in a moment. We see from the map that these movements spread south, especially into the new frontier of Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and especially Kentucky. This would lead to what were called frontier camp revivals. Many of these were actually based off the communion fairs of the Scottish Presbyterian tradition, in which once a year they would gather for the Eucharist and there'd be several days of preaching and repentance before taking it. These ideas are perpetuated then on the religious frontier, which has few churches and few pastors, recall. And so thousands of people from the surrounding counties would come together to hear the gospel. Circuit preachers and evangelists would take the gospel to the frontier in all these new states, especially Kentucky. Okay, um, This would draw many people from the frontier, uh, involving emotional preaching, hymns, and calls for active conversion to Christ. Many of the practices that you might be familiar with in um, kind of revival settings of uh, emotional preaching, altar calls and such, um, kind of arrive from this period. One of the most famous of the camp revivals is called the Cane Ridge Revival in Kentucky in 1801, which drew over 10,000 people. And from this one revival, we'll see many other smaller revivals come about. And for decades, we'll have circuit preachers going through the frontier territories of Tennessee and Kentucky, um, preaching revival, preaching conversion 
to Christ. This is a call to experience the grace of Christ in a new way and to make a decision to follow him. Um, and this religious experience or conversion will be in some ways the most assured conviction of one's salvation. Um, so we see something very good about this, a personal relationship with Christ. But in some ways, the certainty can be placed much more on the experience of conversion than um, on kind of ongoing commitment to Christ and ongoing assurance, for instance. So let's take a moment to see how these uh, experiences were recorded. I'm going to read for you a moment of the account of his conversion from a man named Peter Cartwright. I know he looks like Johnny Cash, but he is not. Um, he was converted in one of these early Kentucky revivals, and he would go on to be a Methodist uh, circuit preacher throughout much of the 19th century. This is how he tells his story. To this meeting, I repaired a guilty and wretched sinner. On the Saturday evening of said meeting, I went with weeping multitudes and bowed before the stand and earnestly prayed for mercy. In the midst of a solemn struggle of soul, an impression was made on my mind as though a voice said to me, Thy sins are all forgiven thee. Divine light flashed around me. Unspeakable joy sprang up in my soul. I rose to my feet, opened my eyes, and in reality, and and it really seemed as if I was in heaven. The trees and the leaves on them and everything seemed, and I really thought were praising God. My mother raised the shout. My Christian friends crowded around me and joined me in praising God. And though I have been since then in many instances unfaithful, yet I have never for one moment doubted that the Lord did then and there forgive my sins and give me religion. Okay, we see here in Cartwright's confession, his recording of his conversion, many of the elements that will be sought in Second Great Awakening preaching. A very intentional con um, confession of sin and repentance. Generally, this was brought about by several hours of both singing of hymns and very clear preaching. We'll see how this is, um, in some ways, uh, given a clear methodology in a moment by a man named Charles Finney. A call to repent and then an experience of the grace of God coming down. This idea of then telling of one's conversion becomes a standard feature of the revivals, of those who have then been converted would come and testify to the work of Christ in their life. So in some ways this was very different than many of the previous um, methods of evangelism, but this was very effective on the frontier. One of the most significant features or figures of this period was a man named Charles Finney. Charles Finney was a lawyer from upstate New York who studied under a local Presbyterian pastor, although he had no formal theological education. He was ordained in 1824 by the Presbyterian Church, although this was done reluctantly because of some of his views that would become problematic later. He began his ministry in, um, throughout New York, preaching in New York City for a while, but he took place in a revival in 1830 through 1831 in Rochester, New York, and this sparked many revivals throughout what I discussed earlier as the Burnt Over District. In 1835, he moved to what is Oberlin College, uh, which was a leading college for revivalism and social reform in Ohio, um, also very significant in the abolitionist movement, where he would teach uh, the study of revival and preaching. One of the things that sets Finney apart from the earlier revivals in American history was his avowedly Arminian theology that focused on the change of the human will in order to choose God. Um, this was not a unique act of the Spirit. There was no predestination, but salvation was fundamentally a human choice and action. And if that is the case, one can in some ways put a person in the right position so that they're most likely to convert. And this is what he calls the new measures, which are how Charles Finney set up his revivalist meetings in order to maximize the likelihood of conversion. So setting these up, he preached these in something called his Lectures on Revival of uh, 1835. So in these, the new measures, the um, revival ought to be very audience-centered, much like we said, focusing on the particular people and sins um, that are present. The sermon is very high in oration, uh, generally of a lower or colloquial style than you would see in the older churches, and he's trying to leverage certain philosophical principles of putting the person in the best psychological state of mind in order to convert. 
He also encouraged very protracted meetings, three to four hours long, in which the crowd would be worked up through testimony, through song, through various elements of how music affected the body. And then when they were at fever pitch would be preached and called to repent. Okay? He would exemplify this by calling for decisions and inviting people who are in uh, emotional trouble of their sin to come sit on the anxious, anxious bench at the front of the church. And he would, so basically he would be preaching here and those considering conversion would be sitting on the very front pew and he would preach directly at them and even call them out by name in the sermon. In order to promote his revivals, he would uh, put ads in the paper and, in, uh, and include very intentional advertising techniques. So we see here very much the idea of religion working in a marketplace going on. One of his other ideas that really helped to bring about the inclusivity of these revivals was allowing women to pray in public and offer their testimonies, which allowed uh, the women in the crowd to have someone to connect with and to see themselves in to increase the likelihood of conversion. And then he would get lists of names and pray and exhort them specifically within sermons. Finney sets all of these new measures out in great detail in his work, The Lectures on Revivals. But I think in this you see many features that will be common in American preaching, especially evangelical preaching from here on out. The altar call, the specific singling out of sinners for conversions, long periods of meaning of song in order to prime the emotions for religious experience. Okay? Many of these things are good and helpful, um, but in some ways Finney uses them in, in I'll just show my cards, in somewhat of a manip manipulative manner. His concept of revival is very much that of an Arminian, thinking that by just putting a person in the right position, one can get them to choose God. And he makes this very clear in one of his works where he talks about what a revival of religion is. He says, a revival is not a miracle, according to another, de to another definition of the term miracle, something above the power of nature. There is nothing in religion beyond the order, ordinary powers of nature. It consists entirely in the right exercise of the powers of nature. It is just that and nothing else. When mankind becomes religious, they are not enabled to put forth exertion which they were unable before to put forth. They are only exerting the power that had bef before in a different way, that they had before in a different way, and use them for the glory of God. So notice what he's saying here is the act of revival of people coming to the Lord's in large numbers is not something extraordinary. It's merely the application of natural means to produce effects. And we can think of this as using crowd psychology, using the right nature of rhetoric, applying the Bible in the right way, and this will naturally result in conversions. Finney goes on. A revival is not a miracle or dependent on a miracle in any sense. It is a purely philosophical result of the right use of the con, uh, constructed means, as much so as any other effect produced by the application of means. There may be a miracle among its antecedent causes, or there may not. The apostles employed miracles simply as a means by which they arrested attention to their message and established its divine authority. But the miracle was not the revival. The miracle was one thing. The revival that followed it was quite another thing. The revivals in the Apostles' Day were connected with miracles, but they were not miracles. So in this, we're seeing very clearly this different view of salvation. Uh, Jonathan Edwards very much saw the revivals of the First Great Awakening as a miraculous act of God, in which he chose to, in a particular way, pour out his grace and blessing. But we see that Finney is saying a revival can be brought about purely by the application of means. In this, we see the influence of the Enlightenment thinking, in which he's applying empirical kind of understandings of the world to religion itself. There's a certain set of means that one can use in order to persuade people of one's position. If one does that effectively with proper orational techniques and calls for repentance, then a revival will necessarily result. And these ideas that revivals can be planned, can be concocted, um, will come up throughout American religion as the continual movement for revival and active revivalist preaching will be a foundational element of most American Christianity from this time until the present day. 
Okay. Additionally, within the Second Great Awakening, uh, the ri revivals gave a very active role to women to be leading, to be serving, and it increased um, their participation in religion and society and led to the later push for women's rights. Many women um, uh, were able to pray at revival meetings and offer testimonies before crowds, which was something they were generally not allowed to do in the more formalist churches. And the, the women who were converted out of these revivals would be a leading force behind many of the social reform movements that emanated out of the Second Great Awakening that we'll talk about in a moment. So in some ways, the Second Great Awakening much greater encouraged women's participation in religion throughout America. Uh, certain traditions, such as the Methodists, would employ lay women exhorters as well to preach and teach at these revivalist meetings. All right, so we've set out many things. The revival begins on the East Coast. It moves west across the Appalachian Mountains into the frontier. We also have a node of revival coming from New York and Charles Finney. And while there are many different denominations working in this, with Presbyterians engaging in this, Congregationalists, Methodists, and Baptists, the most prolific in some ways will be those of the Armenian persuasion. Um, of all those traditions, arguing that one can come to Christ by an act of decision. So let's look at the moment of the consequences of the Second Great Awakening. First, there was a great increase in church membership, especially in the South and in the frontier. It's estimated that church membership went from 10% of the population uh, to a quarter to almost half of the population over the period of the Second Great Awakening. And because of this, because of the nature of this preaching and revivalism, evangelical Protestantism became the dominant ethos in American religion. So I'll explain what that means in a moment. But because there is a, um, a lessening of denominational distinctions in revivalist preaching, focusing much more on individual repentance, sin, the cross, and a new life, um, and this became kind of the bread and butter of most people in the revivals, regardless if it was Congregationalist, Presbyterian, uh, Lutheran, etc., there would be this general sense of religion in America looks like this, shaped by the experiential experience of conversion and commitment to Christ um, as, and conversion as the kind of pinnacle of religious experience. These ideas would very much permeate through America across denominational lines, and in some ways gel the new nation together in this Protestant ethos. However, this Protestant ethos was very much Protestant broadly and not of a specific denomination. And this shows a fundamental shift in the culture of American religion, away from Calvinist orthodoxy that we saw in the colonial period amongst the Congregationalists and Presbyterians and even the Anglican Church, to a much more Arminian theology, focusing on the independence of the human will and the responsibility to choose God um, and the ability to lose one's salvation. That's why one would maybe need to go to other revivals later on to have a new experience of grace, for instance. The Second Great Awakening, like the first, would also cause splits in established denominations, debating over the appropriateness of some of these practices. For instance, the Presbyterian Church split into the Old Side and New Side over this influence of Arminian theology within the Presbyterian Church. Uh, other denominations would follow as well. Another main emphasis of the Second Great, Great Awakening was the need for social reform. So the idea was society could be reformed as well as the individual. So as converted members of society um, sought to live out their call to Christ, society itself could be transformed. Okay, So in some ways, uh, bringing in a very religious take on the Enlightenment concept of progress. Humanity if they're following Christ, will change and fundamentally improve society. So let's talk briefly about how this emerging American Protestant ethos came about and just some of its features. Um, I'm taking this partially from Noel and others. So on the whole, it's broadly orthodox, holding to the traditional creeds um, and the broad Christian view of salvation by justification by faith alone. Okay? There's an emphasis on experiential faith, personal experience with Jesus, and emotional expression. Um, there is also a very Puritan outlook to this, reaching back to the colonial period, not so much in Puritan theology, but the emphasis on personal morality 
and the goal of reforming society. Remember, the Puritans called for America to be a city on a hill, or at least the Massachusetts Bay Colony. This idea will very much get picked up and brought about through the Second Great Awakening, as the idea of American exceptionalism will take on this new route. So we have broad orthodoxy, um, just which then diminishes denominational distinctives and um, leads to this idea that this Protestant religion of faith in Jesus, moral living, becomes uh, the moral foundation for the American Republic. Although there is religious toleration, the idea that America is broadly Protestant comes about in this period, that these are this is the acceptable cultural practice. Okay? Now, there's going to be many dissenters from this, as we'll see, in a moment, but it's the general dominant feel of uh, 19th century America. It's very much this evangelical piety and religion. And in their eschatology, this Protestant ethos emphasizes post-millennialism, or the idea that the efforts of humanity through the blessing of Christ will bring about the kingdom of God on earth before Christ returns. And therefore, with this optimistic eschatology that through the preaching of the gospel, and the um, striving for moral excellence, the kingdom of God can be made on earth. And this leads us into our next main focus, which is the social reforms flowing out of the Second Great Awakening. So you have to recall that for most of human history, the idea that society could be fundamentally changed um, from willed action was very foreign. Most people considered the status quo the way things were going to be and only um, exceptional circumstances or hardships would fundamentally shift the nature of society. However, with this commitment to human rationality and empirical study, and the increased optimism for the um, restoration of human beings through the gospel, there was a large push after the awakenings for the reforming of society in light of Christian morality. And this has generally been called the Benevolent Empire. So a work by tons of voluntary interdenominational societies that focused on a broad range of social issues that had national reach. While before you might have a small group in one town trying to perhaps start a school, now you have a large organization throughout the country of people from various denominations trying to start schools throughout the country. Okay, these societies were also important because they increased lay involvement in social issues and combined enlightenment concepts of progress and the application of reason to society with the work of spreading the kingdom of God. This also is seen then in the, the more anti-clerical understanding of American religion, that the lay people and the priesthood of all believers can accomplish good works throughout the world. Okay? Um, and that can come in extreme. Some are very healthy, others um, are, are not so much. And there is a danger to this idea that as the regenerate individual can engage and reform society, um, such that some people of this movement began to think that the kingdom could come about by human exertion. And, and this is a very Arminian idea of the work here, that um, human beings will build the kingdom of God through their actions. And this is a direct corollary as opposed to a more Calvinist idea of striving for more excellence and societal reform, um, trusting that the God will build the kingdom. So that distinction, that striving for God to build the kingdom versus our striving building the kingdom directly. Okay. So we're going to look at some of those broad range of issues. We're going to just touch on some of them. We'll pick up on some more later of how this religious energy of the 19th century spread throughout society. One of the first areas is home missions. So Christianity began to spread not just through revivalist preaching, but also through new forms of media, such as the founding of the American Bible Society in 1816 and the American Tract Society in 1825. So this is the first mass endeavor to make sure every American has a Bible that they can read and that there are edifying tracts that can be available at very cheap costs throughout the country. This was a very, uh, very prominent ministry throughout this period. There is also then a renewed effort um, at home to evangelize the Native American population. For example, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions would be very active amongst the Native peoples in the country. Note, note at that time, uh, because the United States did not spread all the way west, many of the Indian nations were still co considered foreign nations at the time. This organization was formed by both Congregationalists and Presbyterian churches, and had a very active ministry amongst um, many Native American tribes. You see 
on the left there, the numbers presented. Uh, they were particularly successful amongst the Cherokee Nation, um, which uh, where Christianity very, very much flourished um, in the 1820s. Sadly, this was snuffed out by the Trail of Tears and the forcible removal of the Cherokees from Georgia by uh, Andrew Jackson. Um, although many of them continued on with their faith in Oklahoma, where they were moved to, and many of the missionaries went along with them on what's called the Trail of Tears. So we have an emphasis on home missions. Uh, I'll just note here, I'll be looking much more at the foreign missions activity um, in subsequent lectures as we get forward to discuss global Christianity later. In addition to home missions was an interest in education. Throughout the first half of the 19th century, churches and lay societies invested heavily in education at every level, seeking to create primary schools throughout the country. Um, even public schools at the time very much had a religious curriculum with them. Um, for instance, the alphabet was generally taught using nice little sayings, um, often with biblical themes. For instance, A was, um, in Adam's fall, we send all A. So this idea that A was actually the, the you got taught original sin as you'd learned the letter A in most of the early 19th century schools. This would fall away later on. There was also emphasis then in creating more colleges to produce new uh, leaders for the church and for society. We can see this in uh, the fact that from 1780 to 1860, the number of universities or colleges in the United States moved from 9 to 173, which was quite prominent. Most of these schools would be founded by denominations and would have an intentional mission not only to educate but to form the Christian character of their students. Outside of these official structures of education, there would also be an emphasis on teaching the especially poor children, the Bible, and things like the American Sunday Schools Union. These colleges, especially in the Great Plains, would also be very influential in the abolitionist movement. I've already mentioned Oberlin, which was founded in 1833, but it would be one of the main uh, fo focuses of social activism to abolish slavery uh, throughout the uh, first half of the 19th century. Beyond just uh, home missions and education was a wide range of social reform issues, beginning with prison reform, um, the kind of sanitary conditions and the fact that prisoners have rights comes out of Christian activism in the 19th century. Uh, one of the large emphasis was on temperance or with withholding from alcohol. You can see above me one of the propaganda pieces of the temperance movement called the Drunkard's Progress which is playing off of clearly the Pilgrim's Progress of John Bunyan. But I would note that the concern for temperance, we might look at it today as being overly, um, overly moralistic uh, to withhold alcohol. If you look at the chart to my left, you see that before the temperance movement um, and the Temperance Society found in 1826, the average American drank four gallons of alcohol a year, uh, which is quite impressive. Um, so this dra drastically declined after the temperance movement. So this, this was a very hard drinking culture and the calls by the church to lessen the uh, societal effects of alcohol were probably warranted. You also see pushing uh, different reformers pushing for an anti-war movement and for peace and especially abolition. Okay. So abolition became a main cause in most of the 19th century, which we'll talk about much more next time as we discuss the Civil War. But I'll note that these movements began early uh, in the 19th century and even the late 18th century. Slavery is abolished in most of the northern states in the 1790s, and the slave trade is outlawed in the U.S. in, the, in 1808. Many were moved by their theological convictions of the equality of all humanity before God um, to free the southern slaves, and many societies were formed to promote the abolishment of slavery, to educate currently enslaved people, and to offer uh, routes of freedom to those who had escaped. Um, so this was a main emphasis of many societies in the North and many also in the South. However, this push for abolition would cause much tension within the churches and would lead ultimately to the Civil War. Um, we'll touch more on this next week. All right, seeing this movement of the benevolent empire 
the spreading influence of this broad Protestant ethos. Um, at the same time, as there's this unifying movement, the society can be reformed, and that there is a kind of a unifying sense of um, exper experiential religion, the need for conversion, etc. At the same time as the society is in some ways coming together in its broad spirit, it's fracturing more and more on the ground between different denominations. This is partially due to the stresses of society of the 19th century, which not only saw these changes on the religious level, but also the forces of industrialization, the Western expansion, which caused all sorts of issues, technological change, all of which pushed and challenged the church and led to greater religious diversity and options throughout the 1830s through the 60s. In this way, we see the fruits of religious toleration uh, moving outward, while um, in previous eras, you have one or two traditions that are fairly well controlled, they have clear authority structures, uh, and that's partially enforced by the state. With the removal of the state's hand, the number, number of denominations moves from the original five or six of the colonies up to hundreds, where anyone uh, can basically found their own religious movement. And if there's a disagreement, there is no kind of overarching structure or incentive to stay together, resulting in denominational sit shifts. So as I want to emphasize that at the same time that there's this kind of growing cohesion of American religious experience in this Protestant ethos. There are many alternate routes emerging to the Protestant consensus that are still with us to, today. So just to see this kind of movement playing out. So in the 1820s and 30s is the rise of both Unitarianism, which I've mentioned, and the Universalist churches. Both of these can combine deist concepts of God and in a romantic emphasis on religion as a matter of the imagination and moral conscience. So religion becomes much less about repentance and faith in Jesus Christ and being morally upright and rational. These two branches of the Unitarians and the Universalists will merge into the UUs or Unitarian Universalists later in history. But we see uh, by this map by 1850, these were very prominent denominations within the country, up to about 9% in certain forms of New England. So we see this area that was once very firmly within uh, the congregational Calvinist camp devolving into what we would consider, which is uh, heretical positions. So we have this uh, leftward shift in many uh, religious persuasion, especially of the upper middle class and the, or sorry, the upper class and the elite class. Out of this also emerges what will become liberal Christianity. Liberal Christianity grew out of an attempt to find a third way between the Enlightenment rationalism and traditional Orthodox Christianity. In some ways, this is also an upper class reaction against what was seen as the enthusiasm, the rustic nature of much evangelical religion of the day. Uh, it was seen as much more proper and upright. Most of the roots of uh, liberal Christianity come from the Unitarian Church, but as well as the Congregationalist churches. And this is seeking to develop a form of Christianity that is not based on any external authority, including church authority, or as it will develop, um, the authority of Scripture. We can see here very much the emphasis of Enlightenment thinking and the removal of uh, external authority from religious decisions. Friedrich Schleiermacher's thought would be very influential in this strand, in which religion is redefined as sentiment, in which um, it is the feeling of absolute dependence that is the essence of religion and not doctrine or uh, history, but the internal experience of feeling dependent upon God. The liberal Christians would emphasize that the theology and uh, the theology in the church should be a leader in the progress of humanity and assimilate theology to modern knowledge and experience. These impetus, um, these, these movements would take on greater influence, especially in the later 19th century that we'll look at later. One example of this emergence of liberal Christianity, one of, in some ways seen one of the fathers of American liberalism, uh, is <clears throat> Horace Bushnell in his work, Christian Nurture, written in 1847. In this, we see many of the doctrines that will emerge in uh, what will become a, con a liberal conservative split in American Christianity. Bushnell rejects original sin. He, uh, following Rousseau, thinks that all humans are born good, and primarily it's external causes that cause evil within us. 
Therefore, as one is raised in the right sort of Christian nurture, one will naturally grow in moral and religious life. So there's a naturalization of moral and religious development. There is no need for conversion because if one is raised properly, notice how that's always an emphasis on certain forms of American upper class, right? If you're properly raised, you will naturally progress morally and religiously. This leads him to emphasis, uh, emphasize a moral influence view of the atonement. So Christ does not die for our sins in our place, which would be the substitutionary view, but rather by his death shows us what it looks like to sacrifice and be humble and that God loves humanity. Okay, so it is very much the cross is meant to elicit um, religious feelings within us and then respond as opposed to accomplishing something objectively for us. And therefore, Christ is largely reshaped as an exemplary moral teacher. So Bushnell would um, hold other more orthodox views, but these sort of ideas will take off in uh, liberal Christianity throughout the 19th century. Another movement that we should mention that comes to be very prominent within American society is that of Christian Restorationism, so also known as Disciples of Christ. This denomination is founded in 1831 by Alexander Campbell, who was joined together with another previous movement known as just simply the Christians, uh, founded by Barton Stone, who was one of the chief preachers at Cane Ridge um, that we mentioned before. Barton Stone was actually originally a Presbyterian minister, as, were, um, as was Alexander Campbell, but they rejected the uh, doctrinal basis of Presbyterianism in the Westminster Confession, uh, embraced Arminianism and a what is known as Christian primitivism, therefore moving back to want to refound the New Testament Church and push away any attempts to uh, build theology beyond that. This movement became very popular on the frontier, as you can see on the map um, to my left. In roughly 20 years after its founding, 10%, almost 10% of the population of certain states were um, into Christian restorationism. It was a very big and powerful movement. So the goal of the restorationist movement was to return as much as possible to the practice of the New Testament church. And so anything um, that seemed to be a adding on to that would be passed away. In some ways you can see this as a, um, a re-emergent of radical Protestantism from the Reformation period. One of the common sayings with this is no creed but Christ, which means the rejection of any theological standard other than the Bible or any official interpretation of the Bible as definitive. Many Christian restorationists would likewise reject original sin. Uh, they would reject infant baptism. They would reject any church structure. Therefore, it's a more radical local congregational control, um, leaving almost all decisions up to the local congregation. Although they would stress the utter necessity of adult baptism by immersion for salvation. So this would be one of their clear emphases. And the Christian Restorationist movement um, is still very prominent today. Some of these denominations, the Churches of Christ and the Disciples of Christ, are some of the largest denominations in the country. So in addition to this spread of various more liberal denominations, different forms of Christianity, such as Christian Restorationism, that kind of sweep away much of the traditions of the past and try to start anew, we also see an increase in Roman Catholicism in America from 35,000 in 1789 to 3.1 million by 1860. This is largely brought about through immigration from Catholic countries, including those from Ireland after the potato famine, especially in the 1840s, and many German immigrants after a failed revolution in Germany in 1849. Okay, what can we take from all this? This is a lot of information. I want us to see that within this emerging Protestant consensus that is more or less um, broadly evangelical in the 19th century. We have undercurrents of very different paths that could be taken. We see these moving to the left in Unitarianism and liberal Christianity. We see something kind of new and radical in Christian Restorationism. And even this increase in Catholicism will challenge uh, kind of the givenness of that Protestant ethos. Beyond all these ideas, we'll also see the emergence of other more radical groups, such as the Mormons in this time, coming from the Burnt Over District in New York, as well as the Seventh-day Adventists, as well as more utopian groups, such as the Shakers or um, people founding utopian communities. So in this period of American history, there's a great ferment of religious energy 
Some of it moves into very productive and Christian directions, and others go off on their own. And this is a result of the new opportunities and challenges presented by religious toleration. In some ways, many of the things we've been describing in this lecture today are fundamentally unprecedented in the history of the Christian church, with various denominations, factions, vying for converts um, within the same geographic space, and each arguing for uh, more or less the truth of their religion. But at the same time, denominations are of a different order than older traditions. One can exist across denominational lines. There can be disagreements that do not strike at the vitals of religion. Um, as they would in any other period. So this is a very interesting time and very foundational for the way Christianity will look even to this day. So let's talk a little bit about the meanings of the Great Awakening period. What, what should we take from this in the story of Christianity? A couple are the fruit of religious toleration and the end of Christendom. This really is the moment where things fall apart. The kind of union of church and state, or the alliance of them, that had persisted since the 4th century under Constantine, now with the official adoption of the separation of church and state in America, which will then spread throughout the world in the 19th and 20th century, has fundamentally changed the relationship of church and state. And that has many consequences, as we've kind of discussed. It's also in this period that evangelicalism in its modern form is born. Emphasis on the experience with God, conversion, personal Bible reading, and moral commitment to Christ comes about. This is also the beginning of the first denominations and uh, denominational structures and denominational agencies. This is also, as we saw with the Benevolent Empire, the birth of things like the parachurch. So in this world, the church that we're familiar with, the situation in which there might be a Methodist, Baptist, and Presbyterian church on the same lane that kind of get along and don't get along and yet run a kitchen together and work together on social causes. Um, that idea would have been very foreign in 1750, but by 1850 would have been very commonplace. So the religious environment that we inhabit is very much shaped by this era. And I also want to emphasize this emerging of the unification of this Protestant ethos, this broad sense of conversion, commitment to Christ, and yet, at the same time, as this ethos is bringing the nation together in some sort of coherent identity around revival, around conversion, around commitment and emotional religion, it is simultaneously seeing a fracturing of church institutions as different denominations split and of various different religious movements that are uh, moving out of Christianity or are already out of it or new forms that have never been seen before. So this is in some ways a very confusing time, um, but its confusion and complexity are very much like what we see in our own day, and it's actually in this period that that is rooted. All right, we're going to be moving on next week to see how some of these influences move forward in the period of American history and touch a little broader out there. We're going to look at some of the causes of the American Civil War and its effects primarily on the religious nature of America. Then we'll look at the struggle for the respectability of religion in the academy in the late 19th century in America, bringing in some themes from Germany in the early 19th century. And we'll work up our way to World War I and a little after to see how these emphases of modernity and Christianity came together and then came into conflict and the implications of this for modern theology and the modern church. See you then.